Music plays a major role in many of our lives. My father was no exception. He has been playing the guitar for many years. And so, a white electric guitar has been sitting in the cellar for ages, yellowing away. He decided to upgrade the guitar, also because the white one wasn't worth much. A sale on eBay would fetch a maximum of 40 euros, and that's where I came into the game. I assured my father that if he lent me the guitar, he would get the most beautiful, or at least the most unique guitar. He was okay with it and left it to me. My idea was to replace all the yellowed parts and build the body from the same wood as the neck to create a uniform look. First, I had to disassemble the guitar to see which part I could reuse and which needed to be replaced. It soon turns out that more parts needed to be replaced than I first thought. I hoped that I could reuse all the electronic parts inside the guitar. But that is not the case. The pickups are enclosed in visible white plastic. Plastic that was once white and now appears yellowish in color. It quickly becomes clear that the pickups also need to be replaced. For me, this was not good news, because as a math student, I have no knowledge about things related to reality. I have no idea about guitars, which pickups to buy, which ones work with the rest of the electronics and at which height they need to be mounted. Fortunately, my father is an electrical engineer. After a little research, it quickly became clear which pickups to buy. The idea was not to buy three of the same thing in a different color. We decided to go for Humbacher. In the world of guitarists, they are far superior. But we will see what difficulties that brought to us later. I knew before I started the project that building a guitar would be no easy task. There are a few things to consider. Firstly, the shape. If a guitar doesn't sit comfortably in the hand, it's difficult to play. And secondly, the body. E-guitars have the advantage that the sound is not emitted through the body. The pickups convert the vibration of the string into electrical signals which are emitted by a loudspeaker. Nevertheless, care must be taken to ensure that the strings are always tensioned to the same degree in order to guarantee a consistently good sound. There was a simple solution to the first problem. I knew that my father liked the shape of the white guitar, so I used it as a template. I made the template out of MDF, which was easy to work with, so I could later transfer the shape to the hardwood. The second problem is not so easy to solve. Wood works. It can change its size due to external influences such as temperature, humidity or exposure to light. This is fatal if the strings are to maintain the same tension at all times. My idea was to build the inside out of plywood. Plywood has the property of being very resistant to distortion, which is perfect for my purpose. Of course, I don't want any plywood to be visible from the outside at the end. So, I saw off the edges generously, which will later be filled with maple or walnut. For me, it was the easiest to build the shape, which I later covered with maple or walnut on all sides. To do this, I leave the guitar one centimeter thinner than I want it to be. Later, I glue 0.5 cm thick wood on both sides to create this extravagant look. To do this, I saw the maple and the walnut to exactly the same thickness as my plywood panel. I want to round off the edges of the guitar later, so that I don't run the risk of uncovering plywood, I'd rather saw away more than too little. When gluing, I make sure to leave as few gaps as possible. Sanding or rounding off the edges could also reveal unsightly areas. To prevent this, preparation is essential. Marking which part goes where makes the process much easier. By the way, I am not a skilled carpenter or woodworker. I got into the hobby years ago through my uncle. I built a few things with him in the past. But my main business is studying. So, if you have any tips on anything for me, I would be very grateful if you could leave them in the comments. This doesn't just refer to woodworking, I cut and edit my videos myself. If you notice any parts that are cut too fast or too slow, please let me know. Also, this is my first video with voiceover. I know my English isn't the best, but I hope it's enough to entertain you. 
Because I want a smooth surface later without air pockets, I plane both sides flat. This provides the best basis for further work. The idea now is to glue thicker pieces of maple and walnut wood to the side so that there is no visible edge at the end. By rounding off the edges, I don't want the core of the guitar to be recognizable as possibly being made of a different material. At this point you can see that I have glued wood to the underside. Without that I wasn't sure whether the look would be irregular enough for me later on. It is no longer a secret that my way of building the guitar is very different from the usual way. My choice of wood is also rather unusual, at least for the body. High quality guitars are made from mahogany. The mahogany family, also known as the Kedrak family, is a plant family in the soap tree order and it's mainly found in the tropics. Due to the high demand, nato is often used. The wood belongs to the carob family and has a similar property. At least that is what my brief research has revealed. I can only say that the white guitar is also made of maple, but the guitar only costs 89 euros new at the time, so you can't accept high quality wood species for that guitar. Apart from my unusual choice of wood, my machinery is not quite up to the standards of the high-end guitar makers. I use the cheapest cordless drills, table saws, and at least my grandfather's sharp chisels. All machines that the student can afford. On the other hand, there is no room for bigger machineries in my grandparents' basement. But I'm not here to complain. Beginners use beginners machinery. I'm quite comfortable with the equipment I have. I am aware that I am gluing solid wood and plywood together. This can cause the solid wood to expand and crack because it is held together by the plywood. To minimize the risk, I use wood with a moisture content of only 7 to 8%. However, you have to be aware that the risk of cracks can never be completely avoided. Another problem could be that the walnut wood reacts differently to external conditions than maple wood. If one type of wood expands more than the other, this could also contribute to cracking. However, I don't foresee any major problems in this regard. I constructed my desk in a similar way with a plywood top covered with maple and walnut. After about two years, I haven't any problems with it, so I'm confident that I won't have any problems here either. Another difficulty arises from the plywood core. As the interior is made of plywood, its width is of course not x times the width of my blocks. In some places, I have to cut the blocks narrower to fill all the gaps. Of course, a clever carpenter would have thought ahead and cut the plywood to a multiple of the width of the blocks. But I'm so skilled that I wanted this additional challenge. Of course, I also considered this before. At this point in the building process, I wasn't sure whether the result would match my expectations. I even doubted that I would find it personally appealing. Holding nothing but glued plywood and a handful of scraps of wood that bore no reassemblance to a guitar and were far from producing a single note. I toyed with the idea of abandoning the project to save the expensive walnut. However, as I had already invested two full working days in the project, I was reluctant to burn the effort. So I found myself at the crossroads, torn between the desire to save resources and the reluctance to give up the progress I had made so far. Ultimately, I came to the conclusion that I had no choice but to trust into the process and to continue despite in my insecurities. It was a decision driven by a mixture of determination, commitment and a perhaps a touch of subornness, because I didn't want to waste the time and the effort invested. In these clips you can see the problem just mentioned. I have to adapt some blocks to the plywood core. I have made almost all of these parts several times because they didn't feel well enough the first time. If I would build another guitar in a similar style, I would definitely make sure to do it in a different way from the start. I try to match the wood color and grain of the surrounding blocks and the small pieces because I don't want thin stripes to be visible.
The next step is to cover the guitar from the front and back. To do this I cut the strips of different lengths. At this point I pay particular attention to ensuring that the strips have similar thicknesses. Ideally they should be the same thickness. By gluing the blocks to the side of the plywood core, the guitar is now too thick for my thickness planer. So I no longer have the option of flattening the guitar with the thickness planer. It would have been better to glue these blocks to the side later and use the thickness planer to get the guitar flat. While I am gluing the strips to the plywood core, I take special care not to leave any piece without glue. I don't want pieces to fall off later during the milling because they weren't glued on well enough. I also make sure to press the pieces together well so as not to leave any gaps. To make the guitar look interesting, strips with an interesting grain are of course suitable. In my case I take care to distribute interesting grain patterns evenly. In addition, care must of course be taken to maintain the pattern between the walnut and maple. I also take care to distribute the length of the stripes evenly to create a uniform but random pattern. It's important to take into account the routing for the pickups, the fiddling for the strings and the grooves for the neck. In some places I was not able to work without any gaps. A simple way to fill such gaps is to mix sawdust with glue and press it into the gaps. Make sure that the glue does not dry yellow. Type bond 1 and type bond 2 in particular have this property. If such glue is used, the wood may look yellow after oiling. In my opinion, type bond 3 is best suited for this. It is also more fluid than some alternatives and is therefore easier to work into the gaps. However, I had a gap that was too big for this method. With large gaps, you need a lot of glue to close the gap. This results in the glue releasing too much water, sinking and not closing the gap properly. In addition, glue is not as strong as epoxy. This would certainly not be a major problem with the guitar, but my aim was still to achieve the best possible result. So I cut myself thin strips which I let into the gaps. Adding a little glue and a few tabs with a hammer will solve the problem. Later the small gaps can still be closed using the method just mentioned. Once this is finished, all that remains is to get the surface plan. I only have a small hand plan here, but even that does what it is supposed to. The effort you put into making all the strips in the same thickness pays off here. Unfortunately, in my case, many of them were different heights, which I simply blame on my tools rather than my incompetence. After I have planed away the rough protrusions, I sand the rest. And because small openings are still visible, I use the method explained earlier. Sanding shavings from the product you are working on are the best suited for this because they match the color best. The shavings are also smaller than sawdust, which makes them easier to work with. I rub all edges over a large area, regardless of whether I can see any gaps or not, to get the best result. We need a deep opening on the back of the guitar to accommodate the springs later. On the white guitar these were milled with a CNC milling machine. I don't have a CNC myself, but this job can also be done with a router. And of course all the fun has to be repeated on the back. Once that's done we can get our guitar into shape. In general I would say that it would have been better to use a bandsaw first so as not to overload the router. But I do not have a bandsaw. Fortunately I then remembered that I do have a jigsaw. With jigsaws, however, it is important to note that the blade is only guided from one side, unlike with a bandsaw. It's therefore possible for a jigsaw to cut in an angle. 
If you saw too close to the marking, you may cut into the workpiece. Milling off the rest reveals the shape of a guitar. When rounding the edges, I take particular care not to mill at the base of the neck, as this is where the neck will later be milled. At this point the effort of carefully gluing the parts together really pays off. I only had one case where the router causes tears. Fortunately, the affected area was so small that I was able to remove it by rounding it off. Nevertheless, small gaps inevitably appear. To eliminate these, I fill them with sawdust. Once the cover for the opening at the back was finished, the body is now complete. Complete except for the inclusions for all attachments and fittings. Before I take care of that, I'll close all of the small gaps on the back. Now it's time to turn the guitar into a guitar. The original neck is also made of maple and walnut, is in very good condition. I therefore decide to reuse it. Unlike the white guitar, I don't have a plastic cover to hold the pickups, knobs and the pickguard. This cover has covered the place where the neck is connected to the body. Because I don't have the option to covering this area without such a cover, I have to work very carefully here. To do this, I mill at the correct depth a few millimeters away from my marking and then work my way forward with the chisel until the neck fits exactly into the groove. If you remember, the neck of the white guitar was fixed with four screws from the rear. I didn't feel comfortable drilling additional holes in the neck and wanted to reuse the existing ones. So I transferred the holes from the white guitar to the new one. Unfortunately, that didn't work. I used the top edge as a guide when transferring. I didn't realize that the white one was shorter than the new one and marked the holes incorrectly. Here you can see the moment of realization. Remarking and redrilling solves the problem. However, there are now visible holes on the top. Because I am so annoyed with myself about the situation, I will postpone solving the problem until later. The next step is to mill the inlet for the string attachment. I was very tense at this point, because the basing has to be exactly in line with the neck. Otherwise, the strings will be crooked and can't be pressed onto the neck. I'm sure there are proper technical terms for this, but as a non-guitarist, I don't know them. Hopefully you know what I mean. Another problem could arise from the fact that this joint is not exactly vertical. At the beginning of this video, we saw that the strings are fixed with springs on the back so that they don't warp over time. At least, that's my guess as to why they are there. So, there is high tension on both sides of the string basin. In order to transfer this pressure evenly to the body, it is so important that the groove is vertical. During the whole process, I make sure to use the same screws as on the white guitar. The white guitar was made of maple wood that was painted white. The new one is made of maple, walnut and plywood. I therefore see no reason why the old screws would no longer work. They also match the silver components. All the inlays on the white guitar are CNC milled. I don't have a CNC, but I still have to transfer the inlays to my guitar. If the inlays are too large, you can see them with the components fitted. If they are too small, the components won't fit. Unfortunately, there is a tiny gap between too small and too large. In order to get this right, I used a piece of paper and a pencil to transfer the inlets and made myself a template. I based the depth of the routing on the white guitar. As you can see in those clips, it worked very well. In the same way, I milled the shape for the button inlets. Since I use Humbucker as pickups, I only need two knobs instead of three. 
That's why I made the opening a little smaller, which I will regret very much when inserting the knobs and soldering. Because the edges of the new guitar were milled with a router that has a larger radius than the white guitar had, I can't put the knobs as far to the edge as they were on the white guitar. At first I was afraid that this would affect the look. Fortunately you don't notice anything because I have one knob less. The components that are to go into this inlet are too high for me to make the cover as in the center. In order to still achieve the look of a closed, uniform body, I made use of my strip design and produced matching strips that could be screwed on as a cover. Fortunately, this milled opening is small enough to avoid having to use conspicuously long strips. After a proper sanding of the installed covers, the openings are still visible, but pretty enough that you will never see them while playing, at least for me and hopefully for my father as well. One of the last tasks in the workshop was that one that cost me the most nerves. The pickups are attached to plastic frames, so that they can be adjusted in height later. This is important to be able to adjust the distance to the strings. You also have the option of changing the pickups during the concert with just two screws to achieve the different characteristics. This is not so important for me, but the frame also helps to cover inaccurate routing, which will save my ass. When milling, I use the dust extraction system and a copy bushing to mill straight edges. I knew that this bushing inhibits the extraction, but I didn't know how strongly it does this. I was just about to mill the inlets for the pickups when I saw a spark. I thought it was just one and took care of the shavings in the hole that wouldn't stop smoking. After a few seconds, I decided not to wait for the smoking to stop. So I smothered it with the leftover piece. Looking at the video on my second camera revealed that it was more than just one spark. In this clip I didn't know anything about the sparks. Here I am focusing only on the glowing dust. I knew that if a spark was drawn into the vacuum cleaner it could cause a floor explosion. Except that we have wood instead of floor. That's why I looked at the footage after the embers had been extinguished, to see how far the spark had traveled. Because the situation was more serious than I initially feared, I decided to immediately disassemble and clean my cyclone separator. I also disassembled the vacuum cleaner, cleaned it and replaced the dust bag and filters. Maybe I was too careful, but the workshop is in my grandparents cellar. I wouldn't have been able to sleep peacefully if I had to worry that there might be glowing sawdust in a wood workshop in my grandparents cellar. During the subsequent milling work I didn't use the copy bushing so as not to provoke any new sparks and placed the cyclone separator next to me so that I could quickly disassemble it in the event of sparks. After this upset the only thing left to do was to screw and fill the wrong holes. As this can't cause any sparks, I was a bit reassured. To fill the false holes, I sent maple wood to a sharp point and pressed it into the holes. Once the glue is dry, the excess could be easily removed with a chisel. After a quick sanding, the finishing can begin. The oil I use is Rubio Monaco. Because the guitar is often held in the hand and has to resist a lot of sweat, it needs to be robust. As a working oil developed for floors, Rubio Monaco is particularly suitable for this. The last thing to do was to solder the components. As I use different pickups, I also need a different lever. I decided to build everything from scratch. Finding the right firing diagram on the internet is not that easy. I had the wrong one at first and assembled the guitar incorrectly. 
At this point, however, my father, an electrical engineer, was able to help me again and we finished the guitar together. For the last few minutes, I'll keep my mouth shut and let the sound of the guitar play as background music. If you liked the video, I would ask you to subscribe. This is my first real video and I welcome any suggestions for improvement. Mississippi. I've seen the bridges of the world and they're for real. I've had a red line over the wrist without me even getting kissed. It still seems so unreal. I've seen the morning in the mountains of Alaska. I've seen the sunset in the east and in the west. I've seen the glory that was Roman past the hound dog singers home. It still seems for the best.
the call of home is loud, still as loud. I've seen the parish lights from high up on Montmartre. Felt the silence hang low in no one's land. Though the Spanish nights were fine, it wasn't only from the wine. It still seems all in hand. The yellow lights go down the Mississippi From Bahama Island stories carry on Though those alligators smile stay in your memory for a while There still seems more to come Still as loud